When we see animations or videos of some of the largest ground-based telescopes in the world, I mean, first of all, they're super cool, but many of them contain something very weird too. They seem to be shooting massive lasers into space. That's not like coming down to the telescope or even an attack on overhead satellites, but it really is a huge laser mounted on the telescope and being shot towards the sky. What's incredible is that these lasers are actually helping make the images that these telescopes take even better. So let's talk about exactly what's going on here. Earth's atmosphere, on the whole, is a pretty great thing. It lets us breathe and keeps us safe from dangerous cosmic radiation and stellar activity. But there's always a catch. The problem with the atmosphere is a relatively minor one compared to all of the good that it does us. But if you're trying to take images of space from the Earth, it's incredibly annoying. As light reaches us from space, in order to reach our telescopes, it has to pass through the atmosphere. And this distorts and warps the light rays we receive. The result is blinking stars and blurry images, not what we want from the biggest telescopes in the world. The temperature of the air has a big impact on how much the atmosphere distorts the light. You can think of light moving at slightly different speeds through slightly different temperatures of air, and this results in the distortions and blurriness. One advantage of a ground-based telescope over a space-based one is that they can be way bigger. It quickly becomes very expensive and very difficult to send larger and larger telescopes into space. But we keep doing it because they're free from the atmosphere and they get crisper images because they don't have to deal with atmospheric distortions. Ground-based telescopes are easier to build bigger because we don't have to stuff them inside a rocket and send them into orbit but we do have to deal with the blurriness. Without it, these telescopes would easily produce crisper images than their space-based competitors. But now that they're so sensitive, these distortions are becoming more and more of a problem. Any mirror over about half a meter has to deal with them. Bigger telescopes do let us see fainter and fainter objects, but as they get more and more sensitive and see deeper into space, every tiny jiggle and blur from the atmosphere impacts the images it produces. To get images as good or better than space-based telescopes, the ones on Earth need to defeat this atmospheric issue somehow. They start by usually being built on top of tall mountains, such as the Las Campanas Observatory high above the Atacama Desert where the atmosphere is thinner and more stable so it produces less twinkling. And there's even slightly less atmosphere that the light has to travel through to reach the telescope because it's closer to space. The other thing that's now becoming standard on these enormous telescopes is called adaptive optics and involves deforming the mirrors over timescales of milliseconds. That's thousands of times a second to account for the atmosphere. To do this, they have tiny magnets or pneumatic actuators behind the mirrors. That's basically little things that poke the mirror and deform it. And they can do this many times a second to sort of undo the distortions created by the atmosphere. They need a reference point to do this. So normally you use something called a guide star. You basically decide what it is in space that you want to image. And then you find a really bright star in that area of sky. We know that stars should be point sources of really bright light and with no interference, they wouldn't flicker at all, producing a perfect point of light. The idea is to watch that guide star, record how it's twinkling, and then we know how the light path from it is being distorted. We then feed this into a computer that then outputs the opposite distortion and send this to our deformable mirrors. These then get deformed by the actuators behind them, undoing as much of the distortion as possible and leave us with much clearer images than we would have otherwise. The atmosphere is always changing, so we're sort of always playing catch up here. And hence we need super bright stars so we can easily see them changing on very short timescales. The issue there is that not every part of the sky has bright enough stars for this to work. So what happens if you want to image something in one of those patches of sky? Well, that's where those lasers come in. No bright star, no problem. Just use a super powerful laser and make your own. That's what telescopes are doing when they shoot that huge laser into the sky. They're making a laser guide star, a fake point source of light so they can see how the atmosphere affects the light that returns to the telescope and account for those distortions. This can be done in any part of the sky, so you can always image what it is you want to without relying on the availability of a nearby bright star. Having a large mirror is important to get clear images, but this adaptive system is also essential to get the very best ones. 
You can see in this animation that the wave of light comes in all distorted and fuzzy because of the atmosphere. But the mirror is adaptively shaped to reverse this and gives us a clean signal that will produce a sharper image. Without adaptive optics, images are blurred, distorted, and objects often overlap. But with the deformable mirrors active, resolution increases dramatically and we can see much finer details in our images. The most common laser guide star system is called a sodium beacon and uses a very specific wavelength of light, 589.2 nanometers, to excite a layer of sodium in the atmosphere that's about 90 kilometers above sea level. These sodium atoms get excited and then re-emit the laser light, producing an artificial guide star whose light returns to Earth, interacting with the atmosphere in the same way that light from distant stars, nebulae and galaxies would. There is also a slightly cheaper but less effective type of artificial guide star known as a Raleigh beacon. These just shoot a laser upwards and let it scatter back down from the atmosphere. These are way simpler and hence cheaper, but aren't as effective because the artificial star is created lower in the atmosphere, so it doesn't represent the full journey that starlight would take as accurately. One difference between the lasers and a natural guide star can be that the lasers also get a little bit distorted on the way up so you don't get a perfect point source to start with. So the returning light doesn't behave exactly the same as starlight would. However, it is pretty close, and to compensate for this effect and keep images steady and realistic, a natural star is also monitored and compared to the laser star. The natural star in this case can be fainter than you would normally need for a natural guide star. So many more stars can be used for this, and pretty much all of the sky can be imaged with this method. In most large telescopes now, they actually employ multiple artificial guide stars for further improvements. For example, the Very Large Telescope, or VLT, has four lasers, while the upcoming Giant Magellan Telescope, GMT, will have six. I have a full video all about the awesomeness of GMT, including how it won't produce any diffraction spikes on its stars, so check that out on the channel once you finish this video. I should also say that for these larger telescopes, the adaptive optics setup is usually on the secondary mirror and not the huge primary mirrors. These are often too big and sensitive to be moved thousands of times a second. So often this is all done when the light reflects off the secondary mirror instead. At GMT, the primary mirror has pneumatic actuators behind it to account for fluctuations in gravity and temperature. But the full adaptive optics for the atmospheric corrections are done by over 7,000 magnetic actuators that can push and pull the thin secondary mirror surface over a thousand times a second. With the six lasers, a faint natural guide star, the deformable mirrors and the huge area of those mirrors, GMT will achieve resolutions over 10 times better than the Hubble Space Telescope and four times better than JWST. Let me know what you think of these big old space lasers and whether you think it's cool. Or let me know if you have any questions too and I'll try to answer them in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe if you're new and until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.